Uh, I forgot to tell you in Bible class I wander. Okay, so um, have fun. <laughs> All right, well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So how smart are you? Uh, let me see. Which high school kid can I pick on? I love a willing sacrifice. What's your GPA? What? What's your GPA? <laughs> okay. I'm used to three point something, but that's fine. 80? All right. I, I, forget, I forget that other schools do it differently. Okay. All right. So you're not too bad. 3 8. Yeah, that was better than mine. Okay. If I asked you what happened 150 years ago this month and the implications of what happened, can you tell him? It wasn't that long ago. September 17th, 1862. How many were in Bible class? What in the Civil War? Okay, you can sit down. The Battle of Antietam took place 150 years ago on September 17th, bloodiest day in America. More lives were lost in that one day between killed and wounded in one day. But what is the big thing that happened because of that battle? There you go. Emancipation Proclamation Lincoln was issued uh, following that battle because although it wasn't a Union victory nor was it a Union defeat, it was kind of a tie, but since the Union held the ground and the Confederates went back to Virginia, they took it as a victory, announced the proclamation because they were looking for anything at that point because they weren't doing so well. So they issued the Emancipation Proclamation and the rest is, they say, history. Being smart can be good, right? Back when I was in college, I met this girl in the very strangest and most unique way, and it was an interesting time. Her name was Kit. And we were in line at the blood mobile. And it was one of those days where you had all of these chairs here and then a right angle over here. Okay, and you started somewhere over there. Am I gonna keep you out with me? It's gonna be a challenge. And you know how it is when you get into these long bloodline drives where you know you start sitting over here. Okay. And then somebody over there finally gets up and everybody does what? And then you go like this. Not me. Couldn't handle that. I looked at Kit. Didn't know her at all. She was this strange girl. Well, there may be some truth to that anyways. But she was this stranger to me. I looked at her and said, I can't see in this. I said, let's play hopscotch. And she knew exactly what I was talking about, which tells you how strange she was. <laughs> so the next time it moved over, she stayed in her seat. I hopped over her. And then when the next seat moved over, she hopped over me. That way we got to sit twice as long. And we just started talking. And of course, what do you talk about when you're in college? Well, there was the frat parties. There was the drinking. There was the, all that stuff. But we ended up talking about grades. And she was complaining about her professor. And she was getting an A- minus in his class. And she said, that is going to take my GPA and take it from a 4.0 to a 3.97. And I looked at her and I said, my heart bleeds. Because that A- minus would take mine from about a 2.0 to a 3.5. <laughs> she was a very smart girl. <laughs> but she ended up next to me and we became good friends. But sometimes we can think we're pretty wise, we're pretty smart. But... James, in his letter today, kind of tells us about a different kind of wisdom, the wisdom from God. You were warned, so pick them up. Pick up your Bibles, turn to James chapter 3. 1198, if you need that assistance. And let's take a look at what James starts off telling us. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by his good life, 
by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom. So far, sounding good, right? Then he says the next line. Do I have to wait? Okay. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but it is earthly, unspiritual of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. Ooh, is that a good phrase? That kind of hits close to home. And you know why it hits close to home? Because that's what we are. Our human nature likes to be that kind of person. Because now I'm going to give you a spelling lesson. You ready? This is a tough word. It's one of those, you know, really tough words. Sin. Spell it. Started off with an S and then kind of... Ready? S-I-N. And the middle letter is? And that's the problem. Sin is when we are wrapped up in ourselves and the I becomes the most important. And the selfish ambition is what? What can I do to make it good for me? And we see this probably more often than we want to admit. It's political season now, isn't it? Do you see it then? I don't care which candidate you support, whether it's national, federal, local, state, all the way down. But you will see people who are in it for the me. And they will see, say things that's about the me. Now, some of it they have to. They have to convince us that they're a good person and that they are worthy of our vote. But sometimes you hear it even worse. And everything comes about me. And is that good? No. But that's our human nature. Because ever since Adam and Eve ate that tree, ate the fruit of that tree way back when in the Garden of Eden, they messed it up for us. By the way, did you notice I said I? Or they? I used the plural. Because how, how, who do we usually think of that ate the fruit? Why? Because it says she took it, right? And then she gave it to Adam. I want to put a new picture in mind. And I, I, I wish I could have put this on the PowerPoint for you. All right? Somewhere in my file cabinet is a picture of Eve reaching out for the fruit. Okay? So far, so good. All right? However, with this hand, she's holding on to Satan, who's wrapped around the tree and hanging downwards. So that's her support as she reaches out. But the tree's awfully tall, so she's standing on the shoulders of Adam. All of them were put together. By the way, what kind of fruit was it? Anybody know why it's an apple? All I can think of is because people will eat apples. I say it's a pear. Because it took a pair of humans to bring sin into the world. You can chuckle and moan and groan, it's okay. I do bad puns. But sin brought into the world and it changed us. We were created in the image of God. We were supposed to be like God. We were supposed to be Him. Perfect. And He wanted us the way He wanted us. But He gave us free will. And we took that free will and we changed everything. Once that fruit was eaten, it changed the whole substance. By the time you get to Matthew chapter 5, it changes. Adam was created in the image of God. And then it says, and Adam gave birth to... Seth, I think it was at that point. Yeah, because Cain and Abel's already kind of gone. And he, Seth, and Seth was created in the image of Adam. He was created in the image of sinful human beings. That's where we come from. By nature, we are sinners. And we want to be wrapped up in I. What makes it good for me? And James is picking on that. Because he knows what we're like. And he's trying to take us from where we are and put us where? To where God wants us. And so he talks about what we can be like. And it hurts sometimes. Move on. You got the, um, okay, uh, where am I here? The bitter envy and selfish ambition. Okay? 
Chapter 4, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on, what's those two words? On your pleasures. How many of us prayed for a new car when we were 16, 17, 18? Okay. I can tell you what my prayer was. Lord, I want that Trans Am. Always dreamed of getting a Trans Am. Never got it. Thankfully. That was until about a year ago. I was having to go to Philadelphia for work, and I had to go get a rental vehicle. And they offered me the Lincoln Town Car or the Trans Am. Same price. And work was paying for it. What do you think I got? Trans Am. Of course, I go to Philadelphia. It's snowing. It's rear-wheel drive. That's okay. I grew up with rear-wheel drives, and I grew up in Buffalo. I knew how to handle that car in the snow. I'm passing everybody on the Jersey Turnpike because they didn't know what to do, and I was just going, loved it. But I did learn that Trans Ams aren't so good for me. I might be vertically challenged here. And I sat in that car, and my stupid head was up against the roof. It was the most uncomfortable position, so I ended up driving to Philadelphia like this. Because that was the only way I could stand in that car. I learned why God didn't give it to me at 17. A, I was too tall to understand it. And two, thank God there was snow on the road because I wouldn't have been exactly faithful to the speed limit. Because it did move. But sometimes there are things that God doesn't want us to have because he knows what we would do with it. And it ain't right. And that's part of the problem we have. Because we're wrapped up in the me. And I call that the wisdom of the world. Because the wisdom of this world wants us to be focused in on ourselves. And that is a problem. Because when we're focused in ourselves, we don't see what God is all about. We only ask the question, what's in it for me? And if there's nothing pleasing in it for me, then I'm going to find something else. But God called us to be different. What does he want us to be? Like God. Turn back to, to your text. We're going to just stay right there in, in 3 verse 17. James says, but. I have to say this. You know what a but it is in a sentence? What does the word but mean in a sentence? It's a change of direction. You're going this way, and then you turn around and go this way. I hate lima beans. But, uh, sorry, I throw southern in there every once in a while because it's effective. But, I love green beans. Okay, I've totally changed the direction of the sentence. Same thing he's doing here. What were we just talking about? Selfish ambition. But, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all, pure. Then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial, sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace raise a harvest of righteousness. What does all that mean? Well, you think about it, not one of those words is focused in on me. Every one of those words is really focusing outward. Pure. What does it mean to be pure? Clean. Perfect. Mm, some of us are old enough to remember. Ivory. What was it advertised as? 99 and 44 hundredths or whatever it was. Percent clean. All right, how many of you have no idea what I'm talking about? It's okay. I'll admit, I'm older. All right, ivory was a soap. It used to float in water as a kid. That was kind of fun. <clears throat> Anyways, even that's not pure enough. Pure is 100% 
clean, pure as the wind-driven snow. I mean, when that snow first falls, A, it reminds me of Buffalo, and it's beautiful. It's white, it's clear, everything's just kind of nice and peaceful and calm. And then those snow plows come, and they splash it up into my yard. I have to shovel out of my driveway, and it starts turning brown because I got that sand and all that other stuff in it, and it starts turning ugly. But it's that pureness that we're looking for, to be pure. Clean motive is really what it's about. Peace-loving. The aim in peace-loving is what? Really, the idea is to bring it closer together. To be loving in peace means to bring it all together. It's not just me. It's all of us working together to understand what's going on. And so we want to be peace-loving, able to bring everybody closer. Consider it. All right? Being considerate means able to forgive. Making allowances. To take into other people's consideration. Submissive. Sometimes submissive has gotten a bad word. Okay? Sometimes we think submissive means just kind of lay on the ground and let people walk all over you, right? Submissive really means be willing to listen, to hear another person's point of view and to begin to take their considerations into view. Because sometimes, well, that's exactly what we need to do. Let's say we wanted to repaint this church, okay? Now I can tell you what color my daughter would want. Lime green. She loves that color. But that's her. Being submissive would be willing to listen to the others who say, nice color, with a real smile on their face. Okay. But I don't think that's totally appropriate. Maybe we should look at, and then we throw out a different color, white. That sounds good. Okay. But it's willing to listen to the others because maybe there is something in there that we could use. Maybe we could find a way to use green properly. You've seen some neat um, designs on some stores or whatever who use that color green. My daughter loves to support those ones, by the way, in case you're looking. She's now out in Oregon, so don't worry about it. You don't have to sell it to her. But it's, that's the idea of being submissive, is willing to listen, encompass, and bring in. Okay, uh, Full of mercy. Kind of the word pity but not the pity that says, I feel sorry for you, but the, the pity is the, the truly heartfelt understanding of, I want to do something to help you, to, to do better, to, to make your situation better. That, that's taking true concern and bringing it forward. It's that concern for others. Impa impartial. You know what's right. You know what needs to be done. And in those areas, just stick with it. And you don't waver. Sometimes that's, you know, what do, what do we want in a judge? An impartial. One who listens to both sides, but makes the judgment according to what is right down the middle. What's the standard. That's what it's all about. And finally, being sincere. Being honest without hypocrisy. Now, let's ask the question. Is any of that easy to do? Now, that's why it's God's wisdom. Because we just can't do it because our human nature doesn't want to do it. So what are we to do? By the way, that's a question that the early disciples were asking. If you turn, I should have looked it up. Uh, but I think I'm safe. If not, I'll be changing quickly. Let's see. No, nope, must be Luke. Hold on, then I got to look at it. I forgot to do it before service. Luke chapter. Uh, get past Israel. Yeah, here we go. Luke chapter 3, page 1016. You might remember this guy, John the Baptist. Name ring a bell. All right, what do we remember about him? Prepare ye the way. That's his song, okay? Um, and, he go, and then he's, you know, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Okay? He loved, you get those nice harsh statements out of him. But then, verse 10, the crowd comes back to him. 
what should we do then? And what does he do? He then tells them how to live out the proper life. The man with the tunic should share with him who has none. The one who has food should do the same. All right? It's that whole, that's where we're at right now. Asking a question, well then, what do we do? So what do we do? Let's look back at James and see what he tells us to. Verse 7, chapter 4. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom, which sounds so strange. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. What does he want us to do? Well, submit to God. What he's really telling us to do is to get back to God. And thanks be to God, he gave us that way through Christ Jesus. By sending his son, he showed us what needs to be done. What does it mean to submit to God then? Fulfill his will. Do what he wants us to do. To follow him. That's tough at times. But it's a process that we begin to do. We need to turn ourselves over and say, okay, I'm going to do what needs to be done. Uh, at the start of the service, by the way, you used uh, the song from uh, Amy Grant sang it, Thy Word. By the way, thank you. Amy was my hidden girlfriend. She never knew it. No one else, well, everybody else knew it, but <laughs> never had a chance to meet her. And by the time I figured out about her, I found out she was married, and it just wasn't the same after that. <laughs> Love Amy. That, that was her song that she sang. I think Michael W. Smith wrote it. And anyways, she also has another song that she sang, I Have Decided to live like a believer, turn my back on the deceiver, I'm going to live like I believe. What is she saying there? Here's what God says, here's where I am. It ain't the same. I've decided now to start following God. And so I'm going to make those changes in my life. That's submitting to him. That's following his will. Start to do what he wants us to do. Number two is to resist the devil, because who's going to fight us the hardest? What is Satan's goal in earth? All right? He's going to hell, and he knows it. And he wants as many people there as he can get. So who is he going to go after? Those who aren't already heading in that direction. So we're going to be faced with challenges. God didn't say it was an easy road. It's a tough road. When we start turning and following him, we're going to have to resist the devil, and that's hard. I told the earlier congregation, the earlier service. Four months ago, I found out <clears throat> that I was a diabetic. The doctor said, you've reached that magical level of 3.6, or I don't know what it was, some strange number, all right? You need to, guess what he said, diet. Lose weight, exercise. You know how many times I've heard that? I had a heart attack six years ago. Diet, exercise. That didn't work, but for some reason, being called a diabetic worked this time. Find, God finally found the right two by four to hit me across the head with. In that time, I've lost 30 pounds, which when I put this suit on this morning, let's just say I can do baggy pants now. Just let this belt go and you're all in trouble. <laughs> but I started dieting. I watch carbs. I read those stupid labels on the back and find out what's good and what's not. And what I figured out is what's not good for me is everything that I thought was good. And what's good for me is everything that I couldn't stand. But you get those temptations to try and change. To, you know... M&M peanuts still cry out my name. <laughs> and I got to resist it. And that's the devil finding what I like to try and bring me away, to change me. All right? Those are the same things that happen throughout our lives. We need to resist him. We need to come near to God. What does that mean? We got to get into his word. I've always said, if you've got a pew in the Bible, you've got to use it. 
Like if you got a if you got a Bible in the pew, you got to use it. All right, we got to get into His Word because this is Him telling us everything we need to know about Him. So we need to spend time here. Where else do we need to spend time? Prayer. Because we are talking to God. And he's talking to us. Not as clear as my voice is, but he'll talk to us. And through our conscience, through our mind, through his word, he'll start telling us the things that need to be changed. We need the fellowship of one another. We are gathered here in the church not because we're a bunch of selfless individuals, although that can be the truth sometimes, but because we are a people who need each other. I need your encouragement, you need mine. There are times I will go through something and one of you may be the one who's already gone through that same situation and can help me through it. We need to be with each other. Way back when, September 12, 2001, I went to make a hospital call. Now, we all know what happened the day before, right? I was there. My fire department was called. I was uh, down at ground zero. Uh, from 6 o'clock on to 2 o'clock in the morning, I was down there doing recovery work. I get home. I s barely sleep a couple hours. I get up. I have to go to the hospital because one of my members had been in surgery the day before. I got there, and that man knew absolutely nothing about what happened the day before. He went in. He had surgery. He was out the rest of the night. He didn't hear a word. I was there like this, dog-tired. I don't think I got to bed till 4 o'clock in the morning. When I went in, I was there to minister to him during his time. I might have done that, but he ministered to me. He became what I needed to hear. That's why we are gathered together. We need to be with each other, to be there to help encourage and nurture. That's part of drawing near to God. Then he says, wash your hands. We all know what we do when we wash our hands, right? What are we trying to get off? The dirt and schmuck and everything else that we got on it. We need to wash our hands in Christ because we need to come to him because it is only through him that we receive the total forgiveness of God because he paid a price that I can't pay. And so we need to wash ourselves clean through the blood of the cross. We need to purify ourselves. That's a tough one. What does that mean to purify yourself? Sometimes being purified is not nice. I think it's Peter who talks about gold. We like gold, right? It's a nice thing to have. But how does gold become what we know it as? In the fire. And the hotter the fire, the better it melts and burns everything else. My father was a steel worker and worked for Bethlehem Steel in, outside of Buffalo. And whenever they did a story about Bethlehem Steel plant, they always showed this, this standard footage. But it was this big red piece of slab going across the conveyor belt. And every once in a while, you'd see this little black spot. Anybody know what that black spot was? It was the lead and molten and all that other junk that they put in steel. It wasn't burned enough. They'd take it back into the oven and burn it till it was pure and clean. Sometimes we need to be purified by fire. And sometimes there will be things that go on in our lives that are just helping us burn away some of the evil stuff. But trust me, is fire kind to us? Sometimes it hurts. Sometimes our purification needs to have that. We need to go through those times. But it, we begin to make those changes to help get rid of those things, and sometimes they hurt. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Just seems so out of place in the rest of that, but what does it mean? Grieve about what you were and what we used to be. Because, well, what do they say about being old? If I only knew then what I know now, why? Because it would have been different. Some of those things that I did that when I was young, um, 
yeah, wouldn't have done. Okay? And that's a part of it. Grieve over those things that we used to do. The time that we wasted in not being in fellowship with God. We can grieve and mourn over those. And in a sense, wail. You know, weeping and gnashing of teeth. But ultimately, we finally get to the final stage. Humble yourself before God. Just get down and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Who else did that? Parable Jesus gave. Parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Pharisee came into the church, the temple, and said what? That's so good. And it says he pounded his chest and he was just proud of himself. Lord, I'm just so great. I fast twice a week. I give not 10%, but I give like 20% to the church. I am so good. And then the tax collector comes in and does what? Gets on his knees. Won't even lift his eyes up to God. He says, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. We need to do that. We need to acknowledge that we are sinners. We need to come before God and say, God, I'm not as good as I even think I'm good. Help me be like you. And God says what? That's right, you are. And I loved you so much that I gave you my son. He died on a cross for you. You are forgiven because of him. Now pick yourself up. Let's go back out and let's try it again. So move forward. Grow in the wisdom that comes from God and let him permeate all that you are. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding may keep your hearts and your minds focused on our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue now by offering our gifts into the Lord.